Here's the latest installment of uh, Ezekiel Craylin's endless and interminable story of the two dogs, Flacco and Lucky, and their master, Deke, not Zeke. Don't get the two mixed up. Kevin is behind this, Ezekiel Craylin wrote. Email correspondence, April 9th and 10th, regarding, I woke up in the middle of the night around 3 a.m., date April 9th. Watson wrote, why does Deke sleep in the street when he has a home? Just for all lang syne? I replied, of course, it's freedom for him to still be able to hang and sleep outdoors now and then, and meet up with other street friends who he never would otherwise. It's a healthy balance, the restrictions of living in a supervised shelter and the random outdoor life of a rogue, the best of both worlds, I'd say. I remember, he's very accustomed to sleeping outside, so much so it has the quality of being home to him. As far as choosing to camp right by my building, because I'm there and I'm a friend, I did find it unusual that he chose to sleep behind the structure instead of out front, which he always did previously, because he enjoys the scene, meeting up with friends and so forth. But this time, he selected a quiet spot instead. I think being indoors more has given him a taste of restful oases where he can get a solid sleep. I like that, too, since the pups also can snooze better. I would have posted this email three hours ago, but Deke showed up, asked me to watch the doggies. He just got back. Nothing bad to report. He's been mellow, but he's out there now. And the night is still young. Subject, legal assistance for the elderly just called me back. Date, April 10th, afternoon. That was fast. Unfortunately, they don't handle personal injury cases, which is the type of lawsuit the case number indicates. But she told me if all I want is guidance on filling out my report, rather my reply reply to the summons, the San Francisco Law Library is the place to go. Not just books. The people who work there will help me out, including handing me the correct form. They're conveniently located a hop, skip, and a jump straight down Market Street at the Civic Center near the main library, open every weekday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So I will spend one or two hours there tomorrow. That should be all it'll take, or perhaps two visits at most. No response from my eviction attorney yet. If I don't hear from her today, I'll contact the SF Bar to see if they'll write their wrong. Maybe she's going to call them herself to get the matter resolved. I hope so. After all, she's the one who told me they'll handle my case for free. Subject, 6.30 p.m. now, and my eviction attorney never got back to me. Date, April 10, evening. You'd think... Were she busy, she'd at least pop me a got your email, busy now, I'll get back to you tomorrow, or maybe she's ill or some other emergency. Further thoughts on my civil lawsuit. Kevin is behind this. He's coaching my accuser. The plaintiff wouldn't charge me with letting the pups run around my building unleashed unless Kevin put that idea in his head. And his specific use of the phrase dangerous and vicious is exactly the one Kevin wrote in that hateful letter he taped to my door back in February 2021. Gee, that long ago now? He implanted that phrase in the plaintiff's mind. Kevin is an attorney, though not practicing, so knows the precise legal term to justify putting the dogs down, as well as getting me evicted. Of course, he's also encouraged the plaintiff to create false accusations to a malicious degree. I'm sure his growing senility plays a role in expanding the hatred he already harbors toward me. Good thing I mailed that letter of complaint to a blah blah about Kevin's scary behavior and another about the Myrtle slash Adisa debacle. Kevin has the proof of vaccine papers and pics of the rabies tags that I texted to him. Did he not show them to the plaintiff, make him think the pups weren't vaccinated? How stupid of him, because even if he deleted them from his phone, they're still on record with the phone company, and a warrant would reveal his texting history bad maneuver on the old dying codger's part. As for the alleged ankle bite, wouldn't the doctor who supposedly gave him the rabies shots have taken a picture so I can see any real injury? Why didn't the plaintiff or one of his friends come to my door and ask for proof of vaccination? The papers are stored right there in a plastic box I use to keep my deke stuff. I'm sure Kevin's senility exacerbates his maliciousness and causes him to make false accusations that are easily disproven. Were he in his right mind, he'd know better that he'd get in a lot of trouble in the long run, legally speaking. I just reread Ms. Elvinsborn's answer to a blah blah summons. It's really quite a doozy. No wonder they backed off. Job well done. 
When I get back to the attorney from SF Bar, who couldn't take my case, Mr. Wasserman, he might wind up being interested in filing a lawsuit against a blah blah on my behalf and that of other tenants, because there's a lot of gold in them thar hills. All these twists and turns are taking me to interesting places, and I see now how the jigsaw pieces are falling into place in my favor. Hope you're having a great day, Watson. Signed, Zeke K. Holmes. P.S. And what do you think of a plaintiff's attorney's declaration that the landlord failed to put up a sign warning dangerous dogs on board? Hilarious. It's scripted, Watson. They're pulling my leg. That was the bodhisattva clue. Re 6.30 p.m. now, and my eviction attorney never got back to me. Date April 10, late evening. Watson wrote, Yep, but that's his fingerprint, all right. I replied, Using another resident for his devious plot. The wicked warlock of the East, because he lives on the top floor in the easternmost apartment. Well, if being so frail you can't even walk anymore without a helping arm, I wouldn't call it living. Watson wrote, And what reputable doctor would give someone rabies shots without checking to see if the dogs had been vaccinated? I replied, maybe the three stooges cut a deal to share the booty equally, the plaintiff, the resident manager, and the doctor. Watson wrote, if the, quote, victim did in fact undergo the rabies shots, because Kevin led him to believe the dogs were unvaccinated, the tables could be turned on Kevin. I replied, well, he'd be dead soon enough. The onus will fall like a ton of bricks on a blah, blah realty. I'm sure Victor, our maintenance man, has a lot of beans to spill. Watson wrote, wouldn't that be sweet? I replied, I would ask Mr. Wasserman to send me a dozen of his business cards and hand most of them over to the occupant who attempted to start a tenants union. He talks to so many people who live here. Well, I do not, so he could get the ball rolling. Watson wrote, dangerous dogs, dangerously cute is about it. I replied, ha ha, they sure are. They'll adore you to death if you give them half a chance. Subject, Luba and her two chihuahuas. Date, April 10th, nighttime. Luba and her two chihuahuas crossed my path yesterday afternoon. I forgot to include her in my latest Deke update, so I'm bringing her up now. I've mentioned her before many chapters ago. She's friends with Deke, Boulevard Joe, and a few other homeless, and has two chihuahuas that she pushes around in a stroller. She's a, she's a short, stout Latina lady, around 60 years old, who decorates her face with thick black eyeliner and mascara, lives in a Section 8 apartment on Noe Street, a half block towards and opposite from the Palestinian corner store. I think the last time we talked was over a year ago. Not that I don't see her around, but I prefer to not intrude on Deke's friendships. She never recognizes me anyway from a distance. She smiled down at Lucky and Flacco, who patiently sat by my feet while looking up at her with familial or rather familiar respect. I know these dogs, she exclaimed, and they are not yours. That's right, they're Deke's, I agreed. I'm his friend who dog sits them once or twice a week. And to think I ever tried to talk him out of one of them, she said. Look at them, they truly belong together. Yes, they do, I replied. They're brother and sister with great affection for each other. They get along so well. Boy, I sure miss Joe, she later exclaimed as our conversation evolved. He fixed my dishwasher, my radiator, and other stuff around the house for a good price. I do, too, I replied. They're all living indoors now, meaning Joe and his tribe, whose presence was vibrant and well-known throughout the Castro for muchos años. Well, I want you to give him a message, she stated. I nodded my head, and she continued. My lawsuit's coming to a close soon over that gangster dog attack, so I'll soon be running into some money, and I'd like to help him out. I vaguely remember Deke mentioning the attack on Luba. Happened maybe six years ago. It was a Rottweiler, I think, owned by a neighbor living in the same complex who had a criminal background of the violent sort. Shades of Diane Whipple. Sure, I'll be glad to tell him the good news, I replied, and then we went our separate ways. Later, after Deke returned loaded with a huge sack of shake like some hippie Santa, I gave him Luba's message. Did she say how much money? he asked. Natch, that would be the first thing to come out of his gumbo hole. Of course not, I sputtered while stifling a guffaw. You know she's quite the booze hound, so maybe she's just talking out of her hat, but I think it's a good idea to look her up soon. You never know. 
to be continued.